And here we go. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, today's CNCF Live webinar, Data Protection Guardrails Using Open Policy Agent. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand over to Joey Lay with Cast in by Beam, Beam and Anders Eckert with Stira. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to speak as an attendee, but there's a chat box that I think you've all found where you can drop your questions and um, we'll get to as many as we can at the end or intermittently if, they're, um, if we have time. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording will also be available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand things over to Joey and Anders to kick off today's presentation. Thank you very much, Libby. And good morning, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. My name is Joey Lay. I'm one of the product managers with Casting by Veeam. I'm joined here by Anders Eckert, who is a developer advocate from Styra. And he, we're going to be talking to you about a new concept called the data protection guardrails, uh, which is focused on helping misconfigurations with your data protection environment. So think of backups, think of disaster recovery solutions. Um, and we're going to talk about how to do that with the open policy agent policy engine. Um, and I'll, I'll let Anders um, introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Joey. Hey, I'm Anders, and I work as a developer advocate for Styra, which is the creators of the Open Policy Agent project. Uh, so yeah, today we'll talk about using OPA for the purpose of data protection, and uh, I'll be covering like the OPA side of things, and uh, Joey will talk more on like the topic of, of data protection. So uh, just to get started, we'll see here what's going on. Uh, OK, so before we get uh, started on, on OPA, uh, what is policy as code, or what is even policy? So OPA is an open source general purpose policy engine. So before we kind of, uh, dive into what that entails, we can end. It's a it's a good good to remind ourselves what policy is and and what policy as code is. So basically, policy is a set of rules, uh, and these rules could be anything from organizational rules, uh, permissions, and uh, for authorization, uh, Kubernetes admission control, even rules on what can be deployed or not, infrastructure policy and infrastructure rules, what kind of what kind of instance types should we allow? What kind of security configuration and so on? Uh, build and deployment rules and policy is something we're going to cover today as well. We will show how we can use like uh, policy as part of our CI CD pipeline to enforce things that uh, that apply to the data protection space. Uh, data filtering is another uh, item for policy, and there's so much more. So basically, anywhere you have rules, uh, that's pretty much a, where OPA shines. Uh, so that's policy. And why would we treat this as code? Uh, the simple answer is basically that treating policy as code it kind of provides all the benefits of treating anything as code. So we can work with our policy, i.e. our rules, uh, in a collaborative manner. So we can work with pull requests. We can uh, test our policies in isolation. We can work with tooling like anal static analysis, linters, and so on. So uh, no more PDF documents. Our policy should be code just as anything else. And when we talk about policy as code, we often talk about decoupling, meaning that just as we kind of uh, decouple storage from our application and move that into a dedicated database, we kind of want to treat policy the same way. So ideally, our uh, applications and business logic should not need to deal with uh, authorization or perhaps not even users, but uh, that should be treated 
uh, by a separate system. So that kind of decouples and re removes responsibility from our applications and, and into a dedicated uh, entity like OPA. All right, so that, that's policy and that's uh, what a policy as code. So what is OPA then? So OPA is kind of an implementation uh, for the, all of these ideas. It's an open source general purpose policy engine. And as of February last year, it's a graduated CNCF project. It offers a unified tool set and a framework for working with policy across the whole stack. So there's, uh, even if the topic of today here is uh, data protection, OPA is general purpose again, so it's meant to to cover all of the all of these places where we might need rules. So the idea is to bring a unified platform framework for working with rules and policy. And OPA decouples policy from your application logic, so your application would commonly query OPA rather than to uh, to do things like app authorization or whatnot. Uh, one thing to note is that. OPA separates the actual decision from enforcing it. So when you query OPA for a decision, OPA is going to give you a response, but it's still up to you to do something with that response. That is the actual enforcement. And that is, of course, highly dependent on the kind of context you're, you're working in. So one type of enforcement, which we're going to look into later, is... Uh, for example, in a, in a build pipeline where you might want to say that you cannot merge a PR unless uh, this manifest or this resource passes all the policy checks. And these policy checks are written in a declarative language called Rego. And that's kind of the glue uh, that kind of binds all these diverse and different kind of policies together. And we'll uh, look into uh, what that looks like a bit later too. So OPA, again, it's an open source project. It's got a, uh, a huge community, a big ecosystem of, of tools and, uh, and whatnot. There's currently over 250 contributors to the project, over 70 integrations listed. Uh, and that is everything from like job applications, PHP, databases, Kafka, and whatnot, pretty much anywhere uh, where there's a need for policy, there's probably going to be an existing integration. And there are more added uh, pretty much weekly. So uh, OPA is used by over 800 GitHub projects. So it's, it's very common to integrate uh, for authorization or for any of these other projects or purposes. Uh, 6,600 GitHub stars, almost 6,000 Slack users, and more than 130 million downloads and an ecosystem which includes not just OPA, the actual policy engine, but also things like ConfTest for running policy against uh, files. There's the Gatekeeper uh, project, which is uh, OPA applied to, to the uh, Kubernetes admission control space. There are editor integrations for VS Code, IntelliJ, and so on. So it, it's a big ecosystem. And just to kind of summarize what OPA is, uh, or what, what the benefits OPA brings. I, I like this quote from Kelsey Hightower. So the open policy agent project is super dope. I finally have a framework that helps me translate written security policies into executable code for every layer of the stack. So that's kind of what OPA does and what OPA is. So if that is what OPA does, how does it work? I think there's two aspects that I tend to focus on and uh, those are the policy decision model and it's Rego, the policy language. So if we start with the policy decision model, and this is kind of key to how can OPA integrate with all these projects that they really weren't built with OPA in mind. Uh, and of course they are enormously different from each other. So very, a very heterogeneous tech stack here with everything from like Linux PAM modules to Kafka or databases. So the way it works is that any service and, and by service, we have a very broad definition. It kind of covers all of these things. It's basically anything that can service a request from a user or another service. When that request uh, is received in the service, uh, 
the service passes that request to OPA in order to have OPA make a policy decision. And this policy query is just basically any JSON, any JSON value. And OPA uh, looks at that uh, query and based on the policy and based on any data it has loaded, it makes a policy decision. And this policy decision is also just JSON. So pretty much any service that understands JSON can communicate with OPA. So the next aspect, uh, which makes OPA work uh, for all these different technologies, I'd say that's Rego. It's a declarative high level policy language, uh, which is uh, generic enough to work with pretty much any uh, JSON data or YAML data, uh, while it's still uh, tailor-made for the policy space. And it allows you to describe policy across the whole cloud native stack. And again, just like a real world policy, a Rego policy is just a number of rules. These rules, they commonly return uh, true or false, should the user be allowed or not, but it could return any type of uh, data available in JSON. So you could return strings, lists, objects, and, and whatnot. Uh, OPA includes a testing framework, so you can run tests uh, directly on your policy, and you can kind of build confidence in, in your policy, just as you would with any other code. It's a well-documented project, so check out the official docs. And there's also a playground, so you can try, you can try policy offering without even having uh, OPA installed. So with that, I'm going to hop over here to uh, an editor. I'm just going to open that just to, just to kind of show you the basics of Rego. I hope you can all see my screen here. I'm just going to say policy.rego. I'm going to create a Rego file. The first thing to do is to create a package. And this is similar to a namespace and other languages. I'm just going to call it policy. And uh, and now let's write our first rule. So what a rule is, the first thing we do is to just provide a name. In this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name my rule allow. And the, the way our rule evaluation works, is basically you have the rule head here, which includes the name. And optionally, you provide a, a, a return value. So in this case, we might want to say that allow is equal to true if all the conditions or assertions provided in the body here are also equal to true. So if we do something silly like one is equal to one, yeah, that's obviously true. So if we now go and we evaluate the allow rule, we should hopefully see that uh, this, this rule evaluates to true. Uh, so I'm gonna load, I'm gonna run OPA eval here, which is a simple command line tool to evaluate any value from a policy. I'm just going to say uh, data policy allow. And we can format that a little nicer. I'm just going to say pretty. And we can see that, indeed, this is true. So if we change this to something that's not true, we can see that uh, the result is now undefined. So uh, when, when a, a rule does not evaluate, OPA simply says like this is undefined. So if we want to ensure that there's some value returned, we can provide a default one. So we can say by default, allow is equal to false. And now we see that we will always get something back. We, we, have, an, uh, we have either true or false. So the user is either allowed or it's not. What we might want to do here is of course, uh, have something more uh, realistic. So we might want to add Again, remember that when we query OPA, we can provide any type of value. So we could, uh, or any type of JSON document. So I'm going to add a, a, an input, a document here to just simulate some data. I'm going to say user, and, and that user has some roles. And one of those roles is going to be the admin role. And I'm, I'm going to have my policy here check that uh, if one of the roles uh, is admin. I'm going to say input user roles. I'm going to say admin. 
in input user roles. And for this, I'm going to have to import the in keyword, which is part of the future keywords. Uh, so like that. So if the user is in the admin or group, or if he has uh, the admin role, this should be allowed. And we can see, oh, right, because we did not provide the input file here. So I'm going to say JSON. And we can see now that providing this, we see that OPA allow, evaluates the rule and returns the provided return value. And remember here that this could be any JSON value. So we could say, uh, we could return a string that said yes or no, or even a, a, a complex nested object. But in this case, I'm just gonna uh, I'm just gonna settle for true here. Uh, so if we change the the groups here to be or the roles, let's say this is a developer, and we evaluate this again, we'll see that the the decision is now false because the user is no longer part of the admin group. So that's basically super simple policy or the anatomy of a policy, the anatomy of a rule in a few minutes. All right, so I'm gonna head back to the presentation here. Uh, and I think it's over to you, Joey. Hey, Anders, there's a question in the chat uh, from oh. Patrick. Could we integrate OPA with Azure Active Directory? Oh yeah, for sure. So pretty much anything that can be, that exports, anything as JSON or YAML, or that can be transformed to do so, is, is definitely a viable integration. So uh, for Azure AD or any Active Directory, yeah, you can, you can definitely do so. I think like uh, the way you'd commonly do it is to either uh, provide the data from, mm -hmm. from your Active Directory in an access token or something similar, maybe a JSON web token, that is included uh, as part of the query, but you can also provide data uh, beforehand to OPA. So OPA is an in-memory store, so you could kind of mirror parts of your Active Directory uh, with all, any data that might be relevant for uh, policy evaluation. All right, cool. Hey, Anders, can I just share my screen? Yep. Instead? Okay. All right, you guys can see that? Okay, so let's talk about the guardrails for data protection. Now, the one thing uh, that to, to learn about data protection is it's all about the application data itself and the backups of application data. And historically, you know, data, data protection and data management solutions, they're historically focused on availability, right? So the quick recovery, the disaster recovery, the business continuity of application data. But there's more to it than that. You know, the security attacks that these days are very um, full compromise type of attacks. So things like exfiltration, things like ransomware. The concerns that people have been, their customers have been raising to us has largely been full spectrum confidentiality issues with the theft of data, the privacy of data, integrity issues that really affect is the data that the application presenting, is it legitimate or is it you know, manipulated by an adversary, or is it corrupted uh, in the case of an integrity attack, in addition to the availability requirements. And so we, we need to start thinking about the data protection objectives much earlier in the process. Historically, it's a day two operation, right? Let production be deployed, let it be provisioned, and hand off that responsibility to a data protection team or, you know, an operations engineering staff, right? There are definitely techniques to get the business to start thinking about the data protection objectives well early in advance, early in the dev cycle. And these are a few things that we want to show you. Now, historically, there are two ways to control and enforce access to different objects, right? We have role-based access control. That's more of a granting and authorization technique to say, hey, this, this admin or this unprivileged user can read you know, the PVCs, the stateful data, the services, the secrets. Um, but sometimes we, we want to actually enforce or deny behaviors. And this is going to be more specific to the data protection objectives. 
Think of the recovery point objective, the RPO. Think of the RTO, the recovery time objectives. Retention, so if you're in a specific industry subject to compliance, like HIPAA or you know PCI compliance, you have specific retention requirements. Um, but if you have confidential or sensitive data that you know is going to be a target for an adversary, you're going to want something called immutable backups. And so uh, it's really important to enforce the existence of these objectives upon your data protection infrastructure as code. And we're going to show us a few pseudocode examples um, about how you would implement those guardrails using OPA itself. So the first example that we have is if you're if you're a developer and you're um, if you're using a technique called GitOps. Now GitOps is where we check sort infrastructure as code into a Git repository, and that represents the source of truth for how a new production environment should be stood up, a new auto scaled node should be stood up, and that includes, of course, your production infrastructure as code, right? Your stateful sets, your PDCs, your secrets, your network policies. It also includes your data protection infrastructure as code. And so if, if this code is peer reviewed, you can also have it checked by the policy engine, right? The OPA policy engine. And it's going to be inspecting your data protection code to see that it's meeting the right data protection objectives. So you can see in the example we have here on the right, we have some example policies and an example backup target. In that policy, you would want to look for things like 321. 321 is where we are ensuring that we have multiple copies of data. We've exported it to an offsite cloud location you know, for disaster recovery purposes, and that it's meeting our compliance for retention, maybe it's seven years, and that it has an RPO that actually meets the mission critical objective. It might be minutes, it might be hourly. In some cases, it could be just daily. But we want the policy to actually look at that. We want it to look at it and enforce that when an application developer is deploying a new application, that it's also, of course, deploying the right backup policies. In the bottom example here on the backup target, we've got a bug where the object immutability was accidentally left out. You know, I've commented it out here so I can actually show you the bug. But in a lot of cases, we might just stand up a backup policy and kind of just forget about these advanced configuration settings. And that ultimately is very dangerous, especially in the case of ransomware attack. If you don't have immutable backups, it means the adversary can obviously steal your data, but it can also delete your backups. And if they can corrupt production and delete your backups, you now have a double failure situation where you can't recover your data. And that misconfiguration is particularly dangerous, especially in, in, in data protection. So how does this work exactly? Let's say uh, you're using a GitOps workflow, you know, and if some of you are doing that, that's great. Um, let's say you have a developer who wants to create a new tier zero mission critical data protection policy for their app. They write some prod code, they write their secrets, their policies, their stateful sets, the provisioning of those PVCs, and they write the data protection policy and the data protection backup targets. They commit it all to a new GitHub repo, a new branch, and then they initiate a pull request. That pull request goes off to other developers on the team, maybe the cloud platform ops team, maybe the data protection team to review the that the policy is actually meeting our standards. And then in the background, if you have OPA, the, the engine integrated as well as the policy code, OPA is gonna give you instantaneous feedback about whether it meets your objectives or not. And once all those reviews are signed off, once the OPA engine is actually validated that the code signs off against the policy, you're now going to have, and, and once you merge it back into the main branch, you're now going to have secure protection and production infrastructure as code to deploy to any new region, to you know any new clusters from day zero and day one. Now, the second way to leverage the guardrails, it, it may be more of a, for more, main, the more mainstream audiences, is if you have a dedicated cloud team or a dedicated data protection team who is writing this code to hand off to an application developer. And the application developer, you know, they may not necessarily be seasoned experts in writing data protection policies, but they don't need to be. They can easily consume, for example, by name, the name of you know, our gold standard policy, our standard you know, bronze or silver level policies, Make it easy for them. It's how I always like to think of it when you're consuming security and data protection. Make it easy for your application developers. And you guys are going to have a great partnership in deploying a secure platform, of course, and delivering your applications to your end users. 
so this 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 concept is called admission control, and for OPA you would you would achieve this through the gatekeeper project, and this is helpful if you want to apply your protections a little bit more closer to staging or production, that you actually want the Kubernetes API server to not only do the authorization and authentication according to RBAC, but you want an extra layer to actually ensure that that for example that backup policy or that backup target is actually meeting the uh, data protection objectives. And that's something called admission control, where it's going to send a request to the OPA policy agent, right, using the regal language. And it's going to give a decision that says, hey, this, this API, this code meets or does not meet our compliance requirements. Um, so let's talk about some example policies you should be thinking about if you're responsible for deploying data protection in your environment and you want to leverage infrastructure as code as a way to accelerate and get to market faster, here are some of the policies that we recommend deploying. Um, a basic primer you know, on data protection, it usually is centered around two things, recovery points, uh, re recovery point objective, which is RPO, and recovery time objectives. Put it simply, this is really um, how much data you, you would be able to tolerate in a data loss scenario that typically uh, states your RPO requirement. So if your RPO was one hour, your business is saying you can only tolerate about an hour of data loss in the event of a disaster or a security incident. Moving to the right is the RTO, the recovery objective. And this usually states the continuity requirements. How much time should pass before an end user might notice or it starts to disrupt you know, core business activities? Usually this is negotiated with a general manager, a business leader, somebody who owns the application. It's very important to get that alignment, of course, with your business stakeholder, because this ultimately affects revenue, it affects adoption, it affects retention and churn and brand loyalty of your customers. So as we're codifying these data protection policies, make sure they align with the business. And that's going to help you when you start to author these uh, directly in code, because you can actually show that back to your, your, your stakeholders and actually say, hey, does this meet your business objectives? So the first example here is exactly that. It's talking about the recovery objectives. So in this pseudocode example we have here, we have a backup policy that's tuned to do hourly backups. And that's great for general purpose, uh, sorry, mission critical workloads. A general purpose workload might accept a daily backup, 24 hours. Um, but in this case, you know, we wanna also make sure that there's availability of that data so that we have a copy of that data off on a third party cloud array object store, NFS target, somewhere that's that where if production fails, that you have a secondary target, of course. And so this is looking for, and, and you know, depending on the backup software that you use, you might have different objects you'd want to target. So there's policy objects, there's scheduling objects, there's cron job objects. And you're going to typically want to look for that RPO and validate, is it lower than or equal to what you expect from a data loss perspective? I mean, you can see here in the Rego code, maybe actually Anders can explain a little bit what the Rego code um, is, is actually doing here. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we have a, a, an allow, allow rule here, pretty much like what, what we have it, had in, showed in the, in the example before. And uh, in this case, we kind of just check the, the type of the input. So in this case, the resource is of the type policy. It's just it's a little, a little confusing though because it's 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 a it's actually a backup policy. So it's, it it doesn't check a rego policy, but it 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 verifies a, a backup policy. Yeah, just to check that uh, the kind of the request is policy, uh, and the group is backup.io, and what it does on the third line here it references another rule. So rules are composable. So one rule can uh, reference any other number of rules. And if they all are uh, evaluate to true, then the allow rule will evaluate to true. So in this case, allow is only going to be true if uh, the has backup policy rule evaluates to true. Uh, and the has backup policy rule uh, below, it's kind of simple. We just uh, take this, uh, the spec from, from the input. And I should say here that the input in this case, it's uh, a Kubernetes admission review object, which is what the Kubernetes API server sends to OPA for validation. 
so that kind of explains the the structure here of like the input dot request dot object. So uh, for the for the object, we we use uh, some action in, and I think we we're missing something here. But uh, so we're iterating over all the actions provided, and if there's one that matches or is equal to hourly, we say that we have an acceptable backup policy. All right, and and kind of paired with that. The other most common thing to definitely look for, and this is particularly important if your data is typically a target. So the adversaries, especially ransomware operators, they're they're looking for sensitive data that you know is valuable. It has purpose. It has business value. And they're looking to hold it hostage, of course, by encrypting that data. So ransomware protection is also known as immutability or air gap. And it really depends on your backup product. And you know, if you're in a private cloud or a public cloud scenario, Typically, in a private cloud, you would go for an air gap backup. That that's meaning that there's no network access on a regular basis to that backup unless authorized by a privileged admin, for example. But if you're working in public cloud, of course, everything is always online. So they typically have a write once, read many object store. So it's, and S3 calls this an object lock um, bucket, for example, and the backup. Software, you know, if it supports object lock, it's going to enable writing those backups to that object lock store so that it can create a, a property of immutability. And so depending on how that code looks, you might have an advanced configuration value. Um, in this example, you know, we have a configuration value called object lock true. This, this might set up the bucket to configure it using that object lock and then, of course, send the backups to that, that same object. And I think the Riga code here is also pretty straightforward, right? It's looking for that specific action or advanced metric configuration that says, hey, is, is it true? Is this object lock being enabled? If it doesn't find this, you know, then you're putting, putting the backups at risk for deletion or corruption. Um, and some of the resource types you, know, you might have here are backup targets, locations, location profiles, PVCs, um, just targets, NFS in general. And you know it, it varies, of course, across depending on what software you're using. Um, the third example is related to an availability of your of your backups. So a common disaster recovery policy would have you know you have your production, you have your copy of production, which is sometimes a storage snapshot, and then you have an ability to copy that storage snapshot to an offsite cloud location. And so that's what we would call three two one. Three two one is having three copies of your data two of them on different storage targets, prod and secondary. And then one of those, of course, being in a, another region or another offsite location. Um, you can extend that concept further if you want to include the air gap or immutability property with something called 32110. Um, and again, it varies by data protection software. If it supports immutability, you can have it check for that. If it supports data verification or verification of those application backups, that can be, that can be restored, of course. Um, you know, you'll want to write your policies to ensure that it's able to kick off that test. And, and again, the rego here is very straightforward. It's looking for two actions in the actions array. There's a backup action followed by some kind of copy action or export action to another object storage location. Um, and if it doesn't find both of those specific actions, it's going to reject admission, right? It's going to reject, make a decision that says this doesn't comply with our policy. Um, the last one I want to leave you with is a little bit less common and a little bit more unique, uh, which is a scenario that is starting to come up more and more um, in the ransomware attack pattern. It's not enough to just get your data encrypted, but nowadays the adversaries are also stealing data and they're using um, a variety of techniques to do that. They might steal it directly from production if they've breached a pod and escalated privileges to the node. They might steal it directly from production, which is a bit trickier to protect from. The alternative is that they've breached the data protection infrastructure and they've gotten credential access to a restore admin or a privileged admin. Uh, this is an attack with what we call living off the land. And living off the land attacks are particularly dangerous because they use legitimate software to perform malicious acts. And most detection software is typically not tuned to um, detect incidents on trusted software. So if, for example, your data protection software is compromised or the access to your data protection software has been compromised, there's potential they can use the restore functionality 
to exfiltrate data itself. And so depending on how the data protection software creates jobs or backup jobs or restore jobs in Kubernetes, they would typically be another resource. And you can actually track that resource in, re in using OPA. If you can write a rego, for example, that says, hey, for any restore job that's created, let's look at where it's going. You know, you might want to create a whitelist to say these are approved locations or approved namespaces or approved, you know, approved cloud locations. The, the beauty of the regal language here is that it's very flexible how you want to, to author it. And so in this case, in the exfiltration protection, you might want to write a rule that says if we see a, a restore job going to somewhere we don't expect, shut it down. You know, don't let that job actually kick off. And that's going to prevent any exfiltration of data coming through the backup application. Um, so I'm going to double check to see if there's any questions because we do have a demo for you that's actually going to show the data protection concept, Gargoyle concept in a CI CD pipeline. So let me just um, stop sharing for a second here. <clears throat> um, any questions at all about the policies or anything we spoke about so far? OK. Then we can uh, go ahead and just get to the example then, Anders. All right, great. Yeah, so we have some like basic knowledge of Rego and uh, what the rules look like. And as Joey showed, we also know like what what does these kind of backup policies look like. And again, like given how OPA is is kind of agnostic or a general purpose framework, we can work with any any type of JSON or YAML data. Uh, so one thing to note uh, note here though that. Uh, the way, if, if we check these manifests, so in this uh, demo repository, we have manifests, which are the YAML files that we want to deploy to, uh, to Kubernetes. And we have some policies uh, where we have all these rules, like any backup action must be accompanied by uh, a backup copy and so on. So we have, we have a bunch of manifests uh, and we have a bunch of, of policies. So. Uh, for example, I don't know here, let's check some something here like the ransom one where, uh, where we're checking that, uh, as Joey demonstrated, we, we need to ensure that for any uh, AWS backup target, uh, we, we should deny that deployment if it does not have either an object lock or an air gap uh, type. Uh, or for the recovery scenario, we're just going to check that uh, for any uh, policy, there needs to be a backup uh, for any, I don't know, is there a, for the restore job? We want to ensure that uh, the restore can only be performed in one of our allowed namespaces. So we want to protect uh, ourselves from like the exfiltration scenario. So uh, one thing to note here, when we look at all these kind of uh, manifests, uh, the format of these manifests are going to be a bit different from what we'll actually be working with when uh, these manifests are presented to us uh, by the Kubernetes API server. So the way uh, the Kubernetes API server presents these, again, is going to be in the form of admission review objects. So uh, we could, of course, spin up a cube cluster, have OPA installed as the uh, admission controller, and test things uh, that way. But in the context of a CI CD pipeline, we're, we're going to want to have uh, some form of quicker feedback. So in this case, uh, I, I've written a little tool. It's called Cube Review, which simply takes uh, any Kubernetes manifest, like a deployment in this case, and it, it simply turns that into an admission review object. So in that way, we can kind of shift left uh, the testing. So we create admission review objects, and we can push those into OPAD directly in the, in the CI pipeline and run our tests uh, on those objects. So the way we've done it here in this demo repository is if we check the, the PR uh, workflow here, We'll see this applies on pull requests. So we're just checking out the, the manifest, checking out the policies. We download OPA using the, the setup OPA project, which is basically just 
a downloader for OPA in the context of GitHub Actions. Then we download Kubu re review and we run the validate script. And, and of course, if this fails, the PR is, is going to fail or it's going to have errors. So if we check the, the validate script here, we're going to see there's some just uh, scaffolding here to uh, check that the Kubu review tool is installed and so on. But what we do here is we iterate over all the manifests in, in the manifest directory. And for each of these, we create using the KR or cube review tool, we create uh, an admission review object, which would be identical to what uh, the cube API would present us. So we can run the same policies here as we would in, in a later deployment step. But we'd rather, we'd rather want fast feedback and we'd rather not have to run a cube cluster in, uh, in the build step. We, can, we, we will obviously want that later in, in the deployment. But for, for quick feedback, uh, quick iteration, we just want to run something to verify uh, that the manifests are fine. So again, you might remember the OPA eval tool, which is a simple, simple way of just evaluating uh, a policy. So what we do here is for each of these uh, manifests, we, uh, we pipe that into OPA eval, and we run that over all the policies in the policy directory. And in this case, we have one rule that kind of aggregates uh, all the results from all the rules. And if it's not an empty array, meaning if we check the rules over here uh, or the policies, you can see what, what we're using here, we're calling all of these deny. And these rules look a little different. Uh, they have a string in the name which means these are partial rules. So you can have any number of deny rules. And uh, when evaluated, uh, each of them that evaluate to true will build up a set uh, in, uh, containing all of these strings. So it's basically a way to have your rules return not just true or false. But what we want to do here is we want to provide uh, a reason or a message back to the user to tell them uh, why did this not work. So if we were to change something here and we make this, uh, we'll remove the backup copy here. And I'm going to uh, run the validate script. I'm going to see here that, oh, when, when validating the recovery YAML file, uh, we have a policy violation because policy resource must include both backup and the backup copy actions. So very fast feedback. I can modify uh, my manifests and try things out and then just uh, run the validate script to have OPA evaluate the manifest. And of course, if I am to, uh, I guess called feature branch, where I now have one changed file, I'm going to try and add that. I'm going to commit. I'm going to say remove backup copy action. And I'm going to push that. And I'm going to try and create a, uh, a pull request on that. Uh, so now we're now, now hopefully OPA or uh, the GitHub action is going to run the PR checks, which will run the same validate script. As, as we, we just uh, ran locally. And we're hopefully going to get some pretty fast feedback uh, or get to know uh, what went wrong here. So we see that, OK, OPA, or OPA did not validate the resource. We can check in the details here. We'll see that, uh, yeah, pretty much the same output as we did locally. And, op and, and GitHub will now not allow us to merge this pull request. So a very a pretty simple way uh, to, to verify uh, manifests. Uh, there are obviously more like elaborate things like conf test and so on. But for the purpose of the demo, I wanted to keep it uh, basic uh, and show how you can use like simple tools uh, like OPA eval to run as part of uh, of the build process, and uh, yeah, I think that's 
pretty much it. If there's any questions or or so. So Anders, in that scenario, you know, I'm I'm a platform developer. I'm writing code for deploying into a, a new region or a new mission critical. Yeah, and I don't necessarily have to wait for other people to give me feedback, right? OPA is going to give me feedback and I can fix the bug right there, right? Without yeah. any right. human interaction potentially. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so GitHub is going to tell you like this PR cannot be merged uh, due to the validation errors that OPA returned. So of course we, mm. we could we could uh, do these checks in a, in admission control, but I would mean like uh, we wouldn't know at the at the uh, at the time uh, or at the point in time when we created a PR that this is not going to work. So we'd have the PR merged, and then when uh, we deploy that code, we'd see like, oh, this this cannot be deployed because uh, this is in a violation of this or that policy. So the idea is, of course, to shift lab. Mm. We wanna we wanna get feedback as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Right before you know, before we're on the stage of oh, we have to get the production in the next twenty four hours, and we find all these problems. We can actually find them as we're developing the code to get ready for staging and production. Right to give yeah. us a little bit more time. Yeah, exactly. So like the same kind of uh, validation steps that you run locally uh, are run in the CI or in the build pipeline. So which is which I think is ideal because mm -hmm. then you can you can use like pre commit hooks or whatever you want to ensure that. You probably don't even want to create that PR in in case there are violations. And OPA will provide you with uh, detailed messages telling you which resources in the violation and and for what reason. Okay. Um, so does anybody have any questions uh, about anything you saw? You know, clarification that we need to provide. I've got a few questions. If not. <laughs> Is there a website to learn Riga? Oh yeah, for sure. So uh, again, the the official docs are great, uh, and uh, in addition to that, there's also the Styra Academy, which is uh, a learning resource with things like uh, video-based content, <clears throat> tests, and so on. So I can definitely recommend that. Okay. What is the URL? All right. Yeah. <laughs> you can put, put it in the chat. I'll, <laughs> I'll add it in the chat for sure. OK. Um, I have a question that I saw from a developer forum. So on Reddit, r slash DevOps, um, it was about policy as code. And one of the one of the developers actually commented that we're writing de um, declarative code, you know, like a, like a YAML, right? policy as code is also declarative. And that developer's opinion was actually, that's a little bit redundant, where he would rather see this used with a declarative imperative concept. So the script's trying to deploy something more specifically and a declarative policy to validate that that imperative is actually doing what, it's, what, what we want it to do, right? So he, he had the opinion that declarative was declarative was redundant. <laughs> do you agree with that? I mean, how do you, how do you see that? Uh... Yeah, I'm not sure uh, I've followed and uh, entirely, but I think like, our, was he referring to like having uh, the actual uh, kind of uh, restrictions defined as part of of the actual like policy or like the backup or the manifest? Yeah, because I, I think it has to do with um, we're trying to sh uh, we're trying to meet an outcome, right? And a decorative language defines the outcome you want. And the policy as code is 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 enforcing the outcome you want, so it, it it will protect against, of course, typos and things like we forget code. But if they're just trying to to test the outcome, in theory, both of those approaches will meet the outcome if written correctly. But the imperative is not outcome based; it's action based. Right? It's scripting, so you would tell it to do this command line and this action or this API, and it's not objective based, outcome based rather. Mm, and it, yeah. it is a good pairing of Enforce, enforcement on an imperative language. Yeah, no, I think I, I think I understand. I think like the benefit uh, that I would you know, emphasize is having the rules decoupled from the actual like specifications. 
So the manifests in this file are separate and the policies could live in like an, an entirely different repository or be managed by a different team. Uh, for some cases, of course, if, if it's just a simple check, sometimes you, you might just want to add like an if then if or yeah. else or like as part of the of the build script or something yeah. like that. But once you start to kind of scale up and you have like hundreds of resources and you might uh, have like tens or hundreds of teams and you want to have like uh how do you know like what 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 policies are applied to this type of resource uh in a unified way across our whole organization how do we audit that and things like that so i think sure for the simple use case you can definitely like add some simple checks and uh and so uh as close to the to the actual like data as possible but once you kind of go yeah. past that you're gonna need something more organized and i definitely think this is this is kind of the technology you would use in a much more distributed environment you have a distributed team um, distributed applications maybe there's one central cloud platform team that's responsible for production also responsible for data protection and you've got a series of application stakeholders there's not enough meetings in the day well, you, you don't want that many meetings in the day to kind of coordinate things. Yeah. So if you can codify the organization's practices in policy as code, publish, distribute to the developers and, you know, make it simple for them to consume, uh, you're going to have a very highly scalable organization. Um, and, and, you know, deploying would be the least of your concerns at that point. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 You can definitely have it in different re repos and different, different repositories. Oh yeah, definitely. And and OPA provides several ways to kind of now we were just running OPA eval, which kind of just takes a file on this, but uh, there are there are more advanced ways of fetching like data and policy. There is like a, a concept of remote bundle servers where OPA can go in and, and get policies and so on. So there are many ways of, of doing this. I, I just wanted to keep it like very basic for, for the purpose of this demo. Okay. Um, any other questions and I'll uh, close it out if not. Okay. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending today. I hope, hope it was helpful and, you know, hope, hopefully we can, uh, you know, provide you some guidance on, you know, if a use case that you have might be for, oh, I see a question here. Um, are there any use cases for using OPA against a serverless? Oh, is that a question for me? I think so. <laughs> yeah. Using OPLA in like a serverless environment, right? We, we mostly talked about a Kubernetes environment, right? And you can use serverless in Kubernetes, by the way, but um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, sure. So there's, uh, yeah, for, you can, OPA itself, kind of the, the common mode of operation is, is having OPA run as a service. So you'd have an actual like HTTP server that services requests. Uh, there are there are ways to have OPA and more uh, to run OPA in more kind of a stateless context, which which is uh, suitable for server serverless. So yeah, that can can definitely be done. And I, th I think like uh, another pretty common way of doing it is have OPA run somewhere, and then have something like the the AWS like gateway to query OPA before it kind of forwards. Uh, the request to to lambdas and things like that. So there there are many ways of doing it, uh, either having OPA itself run serverless or 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 just have OPA run as a server, but still in in a serverless context. I think there's a similar question here. Can we can we package maybe the Rego and the OPA engine, you know, for a functions as a service offering? Maybe it's the same question. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually not sure about open boss. I, I've never used that. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to know too. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think our, our contacts might be available somewhere, but I will I will drop my email. Anders, maybe you can drop your email and we can uh, have oh. any follow-up questions. Of course. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're just just uh, about out of time, and uh, we'll thank see you, you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anders and Joey, and thank you everyone for joining us. 
Um, you know where to find them. And we will see you next week for another version of CNCF Live webinars. Thank you all so much for coming. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye now.